Uh, I'm Gareth, I'm from Glasgow, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how we're using containers at Glasgow um, to, to provision or compute um, model. So I'm going to talk a little bit about motivation, uh, and then I want to look at the requirements from a tier two perspective. So this is from my perspective. Um, I should note, I'm not a physicist. I am an electronic and software engineer that somehow landed in running um, physics software. Uh, and then look at, from those requirements, how we decided to build a container uh, and how we go about actually monitoring, logging, deploying, and doing all those sort of things. Now, this thing here is a choose your own adventure story. Um, this is very much a choose your own adventure. You may use containers completely differently from the way that we are using containers. Um, I've already spoken to a number of different people who all use containers in lots of varying and different ways. So this is ours. It may be useful, it may not. Um, we'll see. So what's Scott Grid? Scott Grid's this, this lovely shed um, and this ugly old mainframe room. Uh, we currently run about 6,200 cores with about a quarter of that running something called VAC. I'll talk about that in a second. We're about 63,000 hep spec, about almost four petabytes of storage. Because of the way that our physics building is, is made, we are lumped into two server rooms, which is not how you would ever build a cluster. Uh, so we have to have a fairly fast network in between those two rooms. We've got 160 gigabit trunk network running between our two server rooms to try and get some bandwidth between the storage and the compute. Um, probably the most interesting thing on the slide is this paragraph where we effectively mainly support Atlas. We're an LHCB tier 2D, I think is the, f the phrase. Um, we also run CMS working on a tier 3 for that, which we have recently just gone diskless. Um, we support a bunch of smaller LHC experiments, and most importantly, we support a bunch of local users. Uh, and from my perspective, they're the ones that are interesting because they do odd and interesting things. So we've done bovine epidemiology, we've done National Health Service NHS research, um, we've done data analysis of large quantities of UK parliamentary records. So we do other things as well. Um, we like to be flexible. So what do we look like from a software stack perspective? We are a fairly traditional tier two stack, tier, uh, grid site. We have a range of um, grid services that sit in front of a bunch of RCs and they front a large Condor pool. Um, but we also have this thing over here um, called VAC. So actually, show of hands, interactivity, how many people have heard of VAC? About five. Okay. So we're really interested in automation at Glasgow because you know the, the funding streams in the UK are not always that great and we want to automate things as possible. Um, one of the researchers on LHCB, or I think he's the, uh, the co compute coordinator in, in the UK, um, came up with this idea called VAC. VAC is a way that you can create ephemeral compute out of the vacuum. I think that's the tagline. Effectively, it's a set of RPMs that you install on a worker or on a, on a machine that sets up a, a, a KVM instance that just starts virtual machines constantly. And those virtual machines can either run pilots or in Atlas's case, it actually runs a Condor pull node that just call out to the, the experiment frameworks, job submission engines and pull down as work. So you can effectively get rid of all of this stuff in front and most of this stuff, and you just run these constant creation of virtual machines that are talking um, to the, the pilot frameworks either that whether that's Atlas or LHCB or A and other, okay? So VAC's actually quite cool in that it's really simple. You, you yum install VAC and you've got it, right? You, you configure a couple of input files and it just works. It's really lightweight. It really is just KVM, a bunch of Python and a few config files. And this is pretty cool from a, from a system engineering standpoint. It's auto-updating because every time it starts a new v VM, it pulls out and says, is there a new VM for me to pull down and start running these jobs with rather than just using the same one? So you can get auto-updates of the VM image for the, the, the payload. Now, the downside of that is it's VMs. VMs are notoriously hard to start up. They can take 30 seconds to a minute to get going. <coughs> it, it uses the CERN virtual machine, which has some uh, interesting resource requirements because it statically sets itself to be about 40 gigabit, uh, gig gigabytes of storage. <coughs> Excuse me. So you, you can't really 
um, double count the amount of stores that you're using, and that's fairly inflexible considering that many payloads don't use anywhere close to 20 or 30 gigabytes of, of disk storage. Um, from a site standpoint, it's great because it's auto-updating, but I can't see inside it, and I'm paranoid. Right? I, I run random payloads from random people. I want to see what's going on. I can't do that when it's a VM. Um, and we ran into problems where the scheduling is a little naive when you're trying to schedule single core and multi-core payloads on the same machine. Um, it would often effectively drown out the multi-core payloads and it couldn't run. But there's some really cool ideas. There's some really nifty ideas. So, the I so what we'd like to do is take some of the good ideas for years from VAC and bring it into the main site and do that with containers because, well, that's the new and exciting thing, right? Um, so, from our standpoint, what are the requirements for running a payload? Okay, number one, we need to get CVMFS. No matter what happens, most of the large LAC experiments put their software in CVMFS, as far as we are concerned. There are other initiatives to do other things, but from a, you know, dual average tier two site, that's where we get your software from. Um, there's this thing called HEPOS libs that probably nobody even knows about, which is a collection of RPMs that install some base libraries that used to be are still common across all of the LHC experiments and other people. There are things that they expect to be there. Things like 32-bit um, compatibility libraries um, because some of the code is still 32-bit. And it, they, people get grumpy when we don't install it and things break. Uh, and from an authentication standpoint, the CA policy core, CA policy LCG um, are the trust chain, trust anchors to guarantee that we can actually talk to other parts of the, the, the infrastructure. And then from a site standpoint, what we care about is lightweight resources, connecting to our current HD Condor pool, because we don't have to build it in the infrastructure quite yet. We want good monitoring, because we want to know what's going on. Uh, and we would perfectly like this all to be standard sets of tools, so we don't have to maintain or support our own stuff. We can use other people's things. So, CVMFS. CVFS, CVMFS is really great and really annoying at the same time. It's really great in that you can get any bit of software just in time, and that's fantastic. But try doing anything creative with it, and it will bite you. And it's a pain in the end. So in a container, how do we get CVMFS in? Well, there's, there's really two ways. There are a few other ways out there. But there are really two ways. You can mount it on your hypervisor and bind the mount it in with your minus V or you can run it inside the container. So, bind mounting is fairly trivial. You, you just set up a static CVMS mount in your FS, FS tab, and you just say, minus V, CVMS, CVMFS. Great, you've got CVMFS in your container. It's awesome. This means you can use a shared cache, which means all the containers running on that machine will have that pre-charged cache. Um, and it's really simple, you, minus V. That's, that's one line in your, your, your parameter. The downside is all the required repositories need to be statically mounted. So if I'm running Atlas, LHCB, CMS, NA62, ILC, uh, random local things, I have to mount all of those CVMFS directories on my hypervisor, and then I have to put them into the machine. That's a bit of a pain. And depressingly, at least on vanilla CentOS 7, the bind mounts don't last past reboot, or when you reboot your machine, it won't start up because it can't actually mount them because the network hasn't turned on yet. So it breaks your reboot cycle, which is a pain. Um, now, in true standard form, every time I give a presentation, I discovered in looking around that um, CERN's already got a solution for this. They have a CVMFS volume driver, which will dynamically mount and unmount those drives for you. I haven't got it working yet because I only just found it, but that might solve this problem. Uh, Okay, CVMFS inside a container. Well, you can run AutoFS then. You can stick it inside your container. The downside is you need to escalate privileges. And so you need to have these three things. You need to say make node, which is so you can actually make your AutoFS directory mount points. You need to give it sysadmin capabilities so it will actually mount things. And you have to bind in the device, uh, the dev fuse. The pros of this are, well, you don't need to install CVMFS in your hypervisor. So you've got a vanilla machine again, which is awesome. Um, you can use interesting and exciting things like CoreOS and RancherOS because you can use those read-only file systems because you don't need anything on the hypervisor. The problem is you no longer have the shared cache. You can approximate it with a squid, um, but I'm not convinced if that's going to be as good as a shared cache, um, and you need to be privileged. So for the rest of this stuff, we've used type A, um, but type B is out there. 
So what does our container look like? Okay, it's a bit ugly from a container standpoint. Uh, we use a, a CentOS 6 base image. Uh, we could move to 7, but we wanted to have compatibility with what was currently running. Um, so we use CentOS 6 base image. We install Hephos libs, which is big and ugly. We run Condor inside with a couple of scripts. And the main thing to note here is we're hoping that we can remove the HEPOS requirement by moving to Singularity. So we can run a Singularity container inside a Docker container, and that means that we won't have to have all of this stuff because it hopefully will be bounded to uh, CVMFS. Um, some caveats, which I'm not going to go into in too much detail, but effectively these are all the things that you have to do to make things like Condor work inside a container that's non-privileged, and you can see all of the different layers. Um, we do something exciting with the well, I say exciting. We do something interesting with the grid environment in that we, we bind it in f dynamically from um, CVMFS. So there's two places that we can run scripts that will effectively set up a worker node CVMFS, uh, a worker node grid pool node that gives you your LCD CPs, your XODs, and all your things like that. Um, and that's done dynamically. We, we nick that wholesale from the way that Atlas does their VAC back machines. Uh, and actually, the hope is we could also maybe even remove the requirement for HT Condor because we can run those containers like VAC pull nodes as well. Um, so that's what it looks like. There's a container. It's running. Um, there's our HT Condor portion running in the container. There's an Atlas pilot. And there's an Atlas multi-core payload. And there's all the bits of the Atlas multi-core payload. So honestly, we, we did do it. It works. Um, so this is the bit that I'm interested in. So I've got your payload running, or I've got a payload running, but I want to see what's going on. Um, there's a thing called C Advisor that comes as a container that you can run, um, or it's built into Kubernetes. The library is actually included in the Kubernetes. So if you're running this in a Kubernetes cluster, you get it. Um, it exports a metrics endpoint that can be swept by Prometheus. So we use Prometheus for aggregation. Um, it's really interesting to get the logs out. There's a thing called log spout that you can run and it will effectively suck up all the standard output from a container and forward it onto something. Um, it, at the moment, the logging is not perfectly featured because effectively the pilots in Condor grabs all the standard out. So we need to be creative here, and I'm not quite sure how to be creative here yet, but that's where we're going. Uh, and then we aggregate it to a thing called OKLog, OK but uh, at some point we're moving that to Elasticsearch when we've set something up. Uh, so that's what C Advisor looks like vanilla-y. You can see the process list. You can see the network. You can see the CPU utilization, the memory. Um, this is us aggregating it via Prometheus. And you can get for free these sort of up metrics because it's a uh, pull model rather than a push model. So Prometheus goes out and talks to those endpoints. Um, this is what I thought this was quite interesting. So this is just looking at one machine. We've got four eight-core containers running on it. So these are four eight-core payloads. And you can see the CPU utilization, so stacked and non-stacked. You can see the memory. Interestingly, in the memory, you can see two kind of species. We've got five gig, two five gig payloads, one payload running about 18 gig, and one payload running about 24 gig. And this is the thing that I found really interesting. This thing that one of my colleagues said looked like a 1970s wallpaper pattern is actually a single eight core payload context switching through each CPU. So this is all 32 CPU loads. Um, and you can see here it actually looked OK, and then it started getting a bit crazy. Um, so what I would really like to try is um, pin the CPUs on the containers that we run. So each container gets eight CPUs, you see eight cores, uh, and see what that did, because that was kind of wild when we saw that. Um, so for logging, again, we, we run a log container. It just fires over syslog this thing. And OKLog is just a command line um, logging package where you can effectively query like grep, so look for things for Prometheus in the last five minutes. Um, so what we're looking at deploying this in the future is moving to something, either Kubernetes or Docker Swarm, taking this sort of set of containers, turning that into a pod, and deploying it out. Um, you can see something like, like that, and we can either do that with the, the CDMFS internally or not internally. And the reason we want to do this is because Kubernetes and Swarm have this idea of services that means they will automatically restart containers um, to ensure that everything's running. Because what we'd like to do is move to a continuous integration, continuous deployment situation. Right? What we would really like is our compute resources to be as thermal as possible. Ideally, magically, we would like your job to land at the same time as we have all the libraries just ready for you to run. And then as soon as your job payload's done, it all goes away, right? So that resource can be used by someone else. 
Um, that helps us also from a, uh, an operation standpoint that then every time we update, you get all the security patches. So we're always up to date. We can push out Canadian builds and see 10% of the cluster breaking. And so it also lets us really simply roll that back. Um, uh, so we've got a, a test system that does this. We use our internal GitLab, GitLab runner. We've got a private docker re registry. It looks like that. Um, that's the flow. We, we push to GitLab. The GitLab runner runs. It does a build. It does a push. It pushes it to private registry. And then the worker node continuously pulls down the new one. So we looked at it. We saw what WLCD payloads required, what we think from a tier two spec perspective. We've got a nominal container. container uh, we're running Atlas multi-core payloads now. Um, it seems to be working. Um, we've got some integrated monitoring. The logging needs to have some thoughts to it. Um, and we've got the continuous integration and continuous deployment pipeline ready. The next step that we have is effectively to give a container a lifetime so it will auto expire and then use either Kubernetes or some other mechanism so when that container auto expires, a new one's started, but with all of the appropriate security patches. And that's me. I, I just wanted to say, for, for all the issues and, and annoyances you find in, in CVMFS, please let us know or speak to me, and uh, we will see if we can do something about it. Well, what I really want to know is, is there a way to run CVMFS inside a container and volume mount it from that container into another container? That's really what okay. I want. Let's, let's, uh, uh, I, I cannot give you a quick answer now, but, <laughs> but, but let's speak about this uh, yeah. offline. Okay. You start the container, and inside the container, your uh, HD Condor. Uh, is there a reason to not use the HD, con uh, HD Condor outside and then start Docker with yeah, the HD no, Condor? No, no, no. It's, just a, it's just a choice. Um, so it's, okay. it's what you want to have control. Um, the original idea was to be able to run multiple different things mm -hmm. on the same resources. So I envision a situation where, for instance, I might want to give the tier three resources. So I might actually want to run two sets of Condor pool. Now, you, I know you can do that with Condor, but would be able to say, these, new, these nodes are now going to start up and talk to our tier three, so our tier three can get resources. Or say a random experiment comes along and says, I need Java 1.2 for whatever reason, you know, some, some nonsense thing like that. It's relatively easy to spin up a container for them with their own batch system and to fire it in. You can do it the other way as well, I agree. You, you can have your Condor be the master and then spawn the Docker containers. It's just about how you want to segment up the resources and you, what you want to be in control. I, I don't have a problem with either of those things. We just kind of came from that start. Okay, yeah. thanks. Oui. I'm not surprised that it drives me up the wall. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's 540 odd meg, and, and it's got things like XM Grace in it and things like that. Yeah, it's all the, it's all the OS. Yes. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Thanks, speaker again. Thank you.